see the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world. Uh, hi, it's Edwin Rutch, and this is Dialogues on how to build a culture of empathy. And today I'm here with uh, George Lakoff. Thank you for joining me, George. A pleasure to be here, Edward. Always a pleasure. Great. And uh, let me just give a little introduction. Uh, so you're a cognitive linguist and professor of linguistics at the University of California, uh, Berkeley. And also uh, Wikipedia says you're fa most famous for your ideas about the centrality of metaphor uh, to human thinking, uh, political behavior and society. And you're an author of, of quite a few books. I mean, there's, there's seen, they seem to break down into two different categories. One is kind of academic books, and uh, one of them, a couple of them, are called uh, "Philosophy in the Flesh" and then "Metaphors We Live By." And then you've got a whole series of books that are uh, kind of political books. And mm -hmm. uh, there's books like uh, "The Political Mind," "Who's Freedom," "Moral Politics," and "Don't Think of an Elephant." I happen to have a couple of them right here. Yeah. So some pretty thick, some thinner. And, and the then, latest. What? And yeah. the latest. <laughs> I'm coming to that. <laughs> yeah. So the latest is a little blue book, The Essential Guide to Thinking and Talking uh, Democratic. So uh, is there more by way of kind of introduction, uh, just about your kind of your background and your current academic and political interests? Sure. Let me first hold up a book. There's the little blue book. Okay. Now, um, yeah, the, um, uh, what I'm doing uh, now is working on the way that the physical brain does thought and language. How do you get ideas and language out of neurons? And uh, I've been working with uh, a group at the International Computer Science Institute for the last 25 years in neural computation and cognitive linguistics. Uh, putting them together and putting it together with work on neuroscience and on uh, you know experimental psychology, uh, and uh, that has borne incredible fruit. We've learned a lot about how the brain does thought and language, and especially metaphor, and um, that uh, is going to be written up this summer. So I'm working on a book with Srini Narayanan, who heads the AI group over at uh, ICSI. The other part of this has to do with metaphor. Back in 1978, uh, I made a discovery um, jointly with one other person who did it independently. Um, and uh, what we found was that um, metaphor is not a matter of language, but of thought. We think metaphorically. And since then, we've worked out the details of that. There are certain metaphors that arise before you learn language just by living in the world. And we have a neural theory of how that works, so that just having a brain that's connected to the body allows that. And that explains what is called embodied cognition. That is, your ideas are not abstract. They are tied to your body, to how you move in the world, um, how you perceive, uh, how you understand in general, what your emotions are. All of those things are structuring the system of concepts you use to think with. And um, many of those are metaphorical. And the metaphors are the most complicated kinds because they use other modes of thought. So when you break down the types of thought that there are, metaphors use them all. And that's not obvious, uh, but that's what we've been showing. And uh, so by studying uh, metaphor, we are able to study uh, the most complex thought and answer the question, uh, how is it possible for the physical brain, you know, 100, and, 100 billion neurons and uh, a quadrillion connections, how is that possible? How does that give you thought and language? And we have an initial answer to that. So that's cool. That's what I get to do otherwise. And the other applications, not only to politics, uh, one is some to literature, obviously, but also to philosophy. It turns out each philosopher uh, has a set of metaphors they take literally. And, uh, and then they carry the, carry the reasoning out perfectly. And that is in the book called Philosophy in the Flesh. And then there's a book called Where Mathematics Comes From, where Rafael Nunez and I uh, worked out uh, the foundations of mathematical understanding. 
So when you understand mathematics, and any mathematician understands it, it turns out that um, embodied cognition together with metaphor allows you to uh, understand higher mathematics, to understand forms of infinity, um, uh, exponentials, things like that. And uh, imaginary numbers, infinite numbers, and so on, turn out to be metaphorical, and we can precisely, mathematically, specify those metaphors. So that's, uh, that's done in a book called Where Mathematics Comes From. So that's what I do uh, in my day job. In <laughs> politics. Well, that, yeah, that's really, it's such fascinating work. So you're really like studying the, 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 bi the physical workings of the brain and the neurons and how it relates to uh, all these different fields and to language and linguistics. And, and uh, so, um, that kind of brings us to uh, your book, uh, The Little Blue Book. Uh, with, and um, what we want to really talk about here is like, how can we go about building a culture of empathy? And it, it's, your book seems to be related to that topic. Oh, it's centrally related to that topic. Uh, when I worked on moral politics and was looking for the foundation of conservative and liberal thought, I didn't understand conservatism at all. And so I said, why is it that conservatives uh, have the collection of ideas that they have? Why are they against abortion but for a flat tax or against taxation? What does taxation have to do with abortion? Uh, what are they, why are they against environmental regulation? What does that have to do with abortion? Uh, why are they for um, a tort reform uh, or for owning guns? What does owning guns have to do with tort reform? And uh, then I realized I had the opposite views, which, you know, and uh, I set out to try to understand this via studying my field, cognitive linguistics. You know, I study cognitive science and how people think. And what I discovered was that there were two moral systems behind this based on two notions of the family. We have a metaphor of the nation as family. And um, that metaphor takes strict father families and nurturing parent families and maps them onto conservative ideology and progressive ideology. And those ideologies then apply to different domains, to the market, to uh, religion, uh, to uh, foreign policy, to all sorts of things. Uh, and um, that turns out to explain the differences. And then when we got into the neuroscience of this, it turns out, of course, that a great many people, probably most people, have both systems and are partly conservative and partly progressive. Conservative in some areas, progressive in others. And there's an explanation for this in the brain, which is that uh, when you have two circuits, two neural circuits, uh, one for conservative ethics and one for progressive ethics, uh, and they can and they contradict each other, the way that works is by a mechanism called mutual inhibition. The activation of one inhibits the other, and then the more one is used, the stronger it gets and the weaker the other gets. And that conservatives have been taking advantage of that. Now, what does empathy have to do with all this? Everything. Because um, America was founded on a moral system, and that moral system starts with empathy. Uh, it says citizens care about each other. They have empathy for each other. And they act on that. They don't just sit around being empathetic. They act by forming, uh, you know, both for themselves and others. They act by forming a government that creates a con concept of the public. What the public is, is public provides provisions for everybody. Roads and bridges, obviously, schools, uh, uh, you know, public health measures, uh, food safety me measures, uh, clean air, clean water, sewers. Uh, but also things like um, electri electrical systems, you know, so power grids, for example, rural elect electrification was like that, or um, uh, transportation systems, uh, systems um, uh, in which the, uh, you have air, con air traffic controller systems, things of that sort. Uh, the you know, Federal Communications Commission sets up communication systems. Uh, these are systems that we all need. And it turns out that every private enterprise uses the public and depends on it. And every private person having a decent pr private life depends upon the public. 
So imagine what your life would be like if none of that existed. I mean, it would be sort of like living in Somalia or, you know, or someplace where, you know, you don't have necessarily roads that are maintained and built and, and you don't necessarily have sewers and you don't have, uh, you know, electric grids and, and all of these things. I mean, this is absolutely necessary and it starts with empathy. Okay, so you're saying that uh, empathy is kind of this foundational value that uh, progressive uh, values are, are, are based on. And so how are you defining empathy? What's your kind of working definition of, of what empathy is? Well, empathy arises physically. It, the empathy is a physical phenomenon. And that's what's interesting about the neuroscience. This was discovered uh, in Parma, Italy, back in the early 1990s by Professor Rizzolatti's group there. Uh, and I've worked with the group and I've worked uh, with uh, Vittorio Galese, who's one of the discoverers. Uh, and um, what we did, uh, Vittorio came to Berkeley for a few months and um, we took the primary data that they had on this. What they discovered was this. Uh, they were working with macaque monkeys. They had trained the monkeys to do certain tasks like pressing buttons or uh, peeling bananas or, or crunching peanuts and eating the peanuts and so on. And uh, they had probes in the monkeys' brains that went down into what's called the premotor cortex. It's the uh, part of the brain that choreographs complex actions. And what they were able to do was to show uh, what uh, parts of the brain were active when the monkey did each of these things. And that worked fine. And then one day, uh, you know, they were uh, working on this. Somebody took a lunch break went out, came back, uh, saw a pile of bananas, started peeling a banana, and all of a sudden the uh, monkey's brain started acting, the computer that was tied to it started running, and what they found out was that uh, when the experimenter peeled the banana, the uh, banana peeling neurons fired in the monkey's brain. So what that suggested, and which they later confirmed, was that the same neurons that were involved in acting are involved in perceiving the same action, right? Now, this has to do with moving your face and muscles in your body because your emotional system is tied to your body. There is a physiology of emotions that has been studied since the 1950s. Paul Ekman did the original work and now it's extended. We know what the body does when you're feeling certain emotions. And we know what part of the brains are active when you're feeling those emotions and so on. And it turns out that you can tell basically, grossly, what other emotions other people are feeling. Are they happy? Are they sad? Are they depressed? Are they feeling, are they writhing in pain, etc.? You can tell by looking at someone if there's some extreme emotion they have. And that's a very important thing. You can also tell if they're in the middle of some motor program. That is, suppose they go and pick up a glass of water as if to take a drink, you expect them to take a drink because that's what your motor program would do. So uh, the idea of empathy is this, that you have a physical ability to connect with other people, to see what they're doing with their bodies as if, and, and, uh, as if it were your body, and then to see what their muscles are doing. Uh, and your, your brain automatically connects those to the emotional regions to, to give you a sense of what their emotions are, as if they were your emotions. Now, there's also parts of the brain that distinguish between yours and theirs. So we just got uh, cut off, and you, you were talking uh, about uh, the inhibition that there's, uh, that you can, I guess it's it, yes. that uh, yeah. you can know that your actions, there's a separation between your action and others. Others. Yeah, the reason for that is uh, when uh, the mirror neurons are firing, they fire somewhat less when you see someone else than when you're doing it. Uh, although they're firing when you see someone else. And uh, actually, it's more complicated than that. Only 30% of them uh, work exactly this way, and the other 70% do much more complicated, interesting things that uh, Galazi and I have studied, figured out, and written up. Now, um, what's and there's also a set of neurons near there called the canonical neurons. And they're called canonical because they, they work on what are called canonical actions. For example, if you peel a banana, that is the normal thing you do with a banana. 
you don't normally stick a banana in your ear or step on it or put it on your nose or whatever, right? So this fires when you either see a banana or, uh, or you do a canonical action on a banana, okay? And it's not just bananas, it's anything else. So it is a set of neurons for connecting you to the world in terms of the normal things you do with what you experience in the world. And you can see that we evolved to have this. We evolved to interact with the world, with the physical world in normal ways. So we actually have parts of our brain that connect us socially and emotionally to other people and to the physical world. And those parts of the brain can be uh, either um, enhanced by being raised in the right way or can be killed off by being raised in the wrong way. And that's a very important thing. That is, the way you're raised and what kind of family you're in and what your parents do has everything to do with whether you're going to be an empathetic person and whether you're going to uh, have a respect for, for objects in the world and for, the, for nature itself. I mean, those are very important things to know. And that physical basis is the basis of uh, not just progressive thought, but the basis of American democracy. The alternative to that, uh, in terms of the idea of democracy, is the conservative view. And on the conservative view, uh, democracy is about liberty. The liberty to seek your own well-being and your own self-interest without being responsible for the well-being or self-interest of anybody else. That is, everything is a matter of individual responsibility, not social responsibility. Uh, can we take a step uh, back um, in the terms of, of mere neurons? So as I'm waving my hands here, you're seeing my hands waving and and your body, your neurons are firing as if you are waving uh, your hands as well. So uh, that seems that's what the kind of the empathic connection is, is how sensitive you are to picking up. I'm picking up your acknowledgement with right. your head exactly. waving. Uh, a shaking. That's right. I, I'm acknowledging by waving your head, and, and you, you're getting that. Yeah, and then I know, oh, you're getting what I'm saying. So we have kind of this uh, connection, so kind of a mirroring. Uh, not, of, of each. It, it, it's also a metaphorical connection, because the major metaphor for communication is communication is sending ideas to someone else uh, through some conduit, and what you're doing is tracing out that conduit with your hands. Uh, this was discovered uh, back in 1980 uh, by uh, uh, you know, researchers doing work on gesture, and they discovered there are metaphorical gestures. And now there's a whole field that studies metaphorical gesture. Okay, so then it's, it's uh, the, uh, the actions turn into a metaphor of yes. sorts, and then the other person can kind of pick up that metaphor and it... And it and it creates uh, an experience right. uh, for them, kind of a visceral, felt, ex emotional experience. But language can do the same. Language cre can create visual, visceral, emotional experiences, which is why people read novels or go to movies or watch uh, TV shows or whatever. Uh, that is, language and, and images can, can do that for you. And what's interesting is that they can create in your brain, since all of that, every idea you have is physical in a neural circuit, every metaphor is physical in a neural circuit, every narrative is, everything you understand is there in a neural circuit in your brain. Now, what's interesting is those circuits can be uh, act activated independent of what's external. You can imagine things. Well, there's a great discovery that was made, uh, first by Martha Farah at the University of Pennsylvania, where um, it turns out that the same neural structures that are there used for seeing and moving in the world are also used for imagining. So, and, and the same neural structures also for feeling are used for imagining. So that you can uh, imagine things and put them together. Uh, so imagine a flying pig, okay? Now, uh, we're, you know, uh, called Pegasus, okay? Where are the wings? Right? Well, you know where the wings are. They're attached to the sides and the back, right? And uh, you know uh, where this, where's the snout? It's facing where the beak of the bird would be, etc. What you're doing is putting together the structure of a bird and the structure of a pig, and you're creating a flying pig, even though pigs can't fly. 
Now, it's not the, not the only way you can get a flying pig. You could also have super swine who has a cape and, you know, and has his paws out like that, right? And I, I think the main thing is that you, you can imagine this. Now, it turns out dreams work the same way. Uh, I have a study uh, some years back of the metaphorical structure of dreams. Where what I showed is the normal metaphor system is there interacting with your everyday concerns to structure your dreams. Now, uh, and then the dreams have to do with the activation of those metaphors and your concerns and your emotional concerns in your everyday life. That's what's, you know, and that gives rise to the emotional and cognitive structure of dreams and the imagistic structure of dreams internally. Uh, one of my students, uh, Beth Ford Friend, did a dissertation in the Divinity School uh, and in Berkeley. Uh, where she looked at um, religious visions, uh, you know, uh, St. Teresa of Avila, for example, and others. And what she found was that they were metaphorical as well. And that what was involved was they put together existing conceptual metaphors, that is, circuits in the brain, to give them a, an experience coming from the inside. And when you have that experience coming from the inside, of course, you attribute it to being external as when uh, you hear people hear voices which are generated from the inside. That is, the brain can generate knowledge, inferences, ideas, and so on. And this applies to politics as well and to human relationships, to uh, relationships um, with your loved ones, with your, your family, with friends, uh, and so on. So that, you know, it turns out empathy is right at the center of all of of these issues. Well, that's why I'm kind of uh, delving into the the uh, definition a bit because I, I've looked at this for, uh, from a lot of the um, for some time now, and there seems to be a lot of different use of the word empathy. So I'm really trying to get the sense of clarity around you know what what empathy is. So what it seems to be two parts to it. Uh, what you're saying is one is it's really based on that mirror neuron part where we're mirroring and then the second part is kind of an imaginative and I think that you know, the academics might call it uh, you know cognitive empathy or perspective taking is that uh, the second part of how, how you're seeing it they're not separate they're the same mechanism in the brain that's what's interesting mm -hmm. they're not different from the perspective of how the brain works they're one phenomenon that is it is perspective taking means means that you can uh, you can activate the same circuits that would be involved in uh, interacting with someone else. And that you can imagine it, and maybe interacting with an imaginary person, or with your image of what God might be, or something like that. So the idea is that uh, you have uh, empathy, uh, you can have empathy of all sorts, but there's one mechanism for it, it's not, not like that, and what gives rise to the multiple definitions is our folk theory of how the brain works or how the mind works which is our folk theory is that our thoughts are abstract that they're separate from the body and that's just false as soon as you understand how thought actually works physically then you see that there's really one mechanism and from a scientific point of view there's just one empathy so it, it's like the perspective or so-called perspective taking is is really just uh, kind of imagining uh, some uh, someone else, and it's using all that uh, mirror neuron circuitry, basically, to uh, activate all those feelings and experiences. But in doing that, you're activating that circuitry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, so you're activating, you know, an imaginative version of mirror neuron circuitry, where you're imagining perceiving. And when you're imagining perceiving, you're also imagining acting, moving your body, and you're ima therefore imagining uh, the uh, uh, emotions that go along with the physiology of, of, of emotion. Okay, so if we want to uh, build a culture of empathy, what we're wanting to do is kind of, is basically to enhance that process. And there's like all different kinds of, of, uh, of blocks maybe to that process of, of connecting uh, with each other. Right. And oh, let me tell you some of the blocks. Um, a, um, when you look at 
the strict father model of uh, morality, which is the basis of conservative thought. Uh, it's based on the notion of a, fa of a strict father family. Now, uh, the basic, uh, and that's a moral system. So the question is, where does our morality come from? Well, the same place, it turns out. Uh, our moral mor morality has to do with uh, well-being, our well-being, and the well-being of others that we can connect with. So the very notion of morality involving our well-being, which has to do with uh, neural circuitry uh, in our brain plus the um, uh, neurotransmitters, uh, the, uh, you know, the chemicals admitted in the brain because of the action of that circuitry, and that also caused the action of the circuitry, they're, in, they're intimately connected. Uh, that is the basis of all moral systems, that is, well-being. Now, as we uh, grow up as a child, we experience uh, well-being in certain contexts and ill-being in others. And those contexts give rise to a, a metaphorical understanding of morality. For example, uh, you're better off if you eat pure food than if you eat rotten food. So morality is purity, and immorality is rottenness, right? Something's rotten in the state of Denmark. Those are rotten things to do. You have purification rituals around the world, and so on. Uh, or um, every one-year-old knows that it's better to be able to stand up and walk on two legs than to uh, have to crawl on the ground. So morality is uprightness, and uh, immorality is being low down, underhanded, uh, and, you know, uh, being a snake in the grass, etc. Right? Uh, you have uh, the idea that uh, you're better off if you have the things you need than if you don't. Right. Uh, so uh, that gives rise to the idea that um, uh, well-being is wealth and uh, ill-being is poverty. Poor John, you know, this is the word for, for being poor uh, is used also for um, uh, for having ill-being, for not having well-being. Um, then and that gives rise to uh, coming together with the notion of well-being as wealth and accounting gives rise to uh, a, met a complex metaphor of moral accounting. Where if I do you a favor, then you owe me one. How can I ever repay you, etc.? If uh, you hurt me, then I can repay you in kind and hurt you back, or I or you can make up for it and uh, you know recompense me and so on. So moral accounting is part of that. And a big part of it has to do with the family. That is, you're better off, generally, if your parents nurture you than if you don't. So morality is nurturance. You're better off if you listen to your parents than if you don't. So morality is obedience to legitimate authority. Right? That notion of morality is obedience to parents and legitimate authority gives rise to a strict father family. The other metaphor gives rise to a nurturing parent family. Those metaphors arise just by living in the world. They arise because two parts of your brain, one with well-being and one with some other experience, are activated together. When they're activated together, activation spreads to find the shortest pathway between them, and uh, neural learning will create a metaphor which is that pathway, so that you will learn metaphors for morality before you even learn to talk and then the language will follow suit. But you learn those so early and they're shaped in your family. And so uh, the question of whether you are, and everybody will learn both of them. The question is which one is enhanced and which one is not enhanced. If you're neglected or beaten from the time you're born, one thing will happen. If you're loved and cuddled and taken care of, another thing will happen. And those are really crucial. In, in all of these in all of these circumstances. So it's like how are we uh, fostering empathy within children from the very beginning? Uh, right. is, is kind of what you're looking at. It, it, and what about uh, the aspect of fear as a block? Because it seems that uh, fear is something that empathy seems to need kind of a, an open awareness to be able to take in others, and fear can kind of shrink uh, that right. awareness. Well, fear is, you know, part, one of our natural emotions, and it has to do with um, uh, homeostasis that is in the body that is maintaining safety. 
And so uh, if you have fear, what that does to maintain safety is shut down empathy with your attacker. If, you know, uh, now, if your attacker is your parent, then, you know, the possibilities for empathy are, are, are cut down to, to, to a large extent, you know, and uh, that, that makes it more difficult. So, uh, yes, uh, you know, what that does, fear has the mechanism of uh, shutting down empathy with the person you fear. And, um, you know, the, again, it's mutual inhibition. Yeah, so there, there's uh, the, it, mutual inhibition in a sense that uh, we, if we have circuitry of empathy and, wa and wanting to connect, and that's kind of like a natural capacity we have, we also have a, a, a circuitry for fear and, and protection to, that shuts down the empathic connection with others. Right. Exactly. So it's, it's very important to overcome that fear and to cultivate that empathy. And I can't stress how important childhood is. Uh, by the time you're five, half of your neural connections die. Now that leaves you a lot. I mean, you're born with 100 billion neurons. Uh, each neuron has between 1,000 and 10,000 connections, so that you know, you're born with about a, a quadrillion connections in your brain. Uh, half of them die off by the time you're five, depending on your experience. The ones that are least used die off, still leaves you with half a quadrillion. And there's lots of changes that can occur after five. But what happens between birth and five shapes your brain. And that's why early experience is the most important determinant of the possibilities for empathy. Well, there's a, a whole movement that I'm just becoming aware of, of kind of like attachment, early attachment uh, training, where it's the importance of, of right. mirroring the child and kind of being present and holding in that physical uh, connection and that reflecting of, of, the, of the child. That's right. Uh, if you go back to my book on moral politics back in 1996, there's a chapter on raising children and a whole chapter on, at on attachment theory and what attachment shows uh, then, it's been uh, elaborated since then but more confirmed, that early attachment is extremely important uh, in building empathy and that uh, this started from the study of, uh, uh, of killers. Uh, it started in England, they tried to figure out how killers were brought up and they were largely brought up without empathy. They're brought up, uh, you know, without attachment, uh, and that's uh, a major, uh, a major finding. So uh, this is extremely important. Attachment theory in uh, raising children is a, a very, very important part of raising children. Um, abuse theory, you know, what is it? What is the opposite? What is it? How are children abused? And children are often abused when they're punished for doing things that are wrong, when they're physically punished, et cetera, uh, as opposed to when they're uh, positively uh, reinforced for doing the things that are right. You can do that either way, and that's a very important difference. Uh, so uh, these are you know, crucial differences in childhood for building empathy. And um, what's interesting here is that uh, the word empathy is sometimes confused largely by conservatives with sympathy, mm. since they don't believe in empathy and don't think you should. Then they may not may have less of it, and that's another question: Do they have less empathy? There are people who claim they do, and I don't know whether that's true or, or not in terms of the science of it. Uh, uh, I suspect it may be, but I don't know. There's a very important finding, of course, which is that uh, conservatives. Uh, have uh, in in group nurturance. That is, they care, they take care of the people in their group, uh, and uh, but not out not out group. And this is certainly true in the military. In the military, you know, you form you know teams, and people take care of pe each other on the team, but they're fighting against people outside the team. Uh, and uh, that's a, a very common situation, where you know you take care of people in your tribe, and you. Uh, you know, uh, you know, fight against people outside your tribe uh, historically in terms of that. So this is, um, uh, again, uh, a com complexity that you find. It's not that conservatives never have any empathy for any, every, anybody. They may have very well have empathy for their friends and neighbors. 
they may very well have empathy for people in their group. Yeah, so we're kind of talking about in-group and out-groups of empathy. It's like, who do we have empathy? Is it for our families? Is it for people with similar political beliefs? Is it for people with the same religion, for the same ethnic group? And so there's this whole dynamic of, of how we kind of open ourselves for empathic connection and maybe the, who we fear and see as kind of the other. I, I think that's right. I think that's really important to see that uh, that that's the case, that uh, the issue of empathic connection and what blocks it uh, is at the center of all social life and political life. Uh, you know, you were talking about uh, metaphor in doing these uh, dialogues. We've done about 110 of them so far, and I'm starting to start them off actually by asking, what is your metaphor for empathy? And it's amazing. Everybody has a different metaphor and there's a typical metaphor of, you know, standing in someone else's suit, shoes, looking through someone else's eyes. For me, empathy is like a cornucopia in the sense that it opens this door to a wide um, variety of feelings and experiences more than I would have just on, on my own. So I'm wondering, what is your metaphor of empathy? Well, first, let's look at those. Uh, yours has to do with the effect, causal effects rather than the ex direct experience. And the others have to do with the direct experience of uh, having someone else's experience. Now that has to do with another metaphor system, which is the metaphor system for the self. By the way, if you want to read about these metaphor systems, the uh, book to look at is Philosophy in the Flesh by myself and Mark Johnson. It's uh, a large, easy to read book. <laughs> But and it's large because it goes into all this stuff in very great detail. But again, it's easy to read and fun, and it goes through uh, all the metaphors for morality and for everything else and for the self. And the basic uh, understanding of the self is the difference between uh, your locus of consciousness and the rest of you. And uh, your locus of consciousness is usually understood as separate from your body. Uh, so that there's a one distinction is you versus your body. Another one is you versus your social roles, uh, you know, or, uh, you know, you versus some other person inside you. So you can be fighting with yourself and so on. And uh, those, uh, there's a whole set of these metaphors, uh, almost two dozen, uh, that we have for understanding who we are. And those metaphors are going to be uh, under, used in understanding empathy metaphorically. So the question is, can you project your conscious experience, your consciousness, your what's called subject, into someone else? And when you do that and can truly understand what, those, what it would be to be in someone else, that's one way of understanding empathy. Why? because what your mirror on neurons are doing is connecting you emotionally to see what it would be like to see, be someone else and understand their emotions, but also understand what they're doing as, as they're doing it. So in, in, in essence, the experience of projecting into someone else is given by the mirror neurons. Yeah, so it, it's, a, it's kind of like connecting to my own with the, the uh, the own experience of what it feels like to have a wide variety of feelings. I'm kind of taking that experience right. and kind of extending it. Right. Mm -hmm. But I, I think the most important thing to understand is that this is a scientific finding. It has to do with actual neuroscience. And, uh, you know, and it's not, a, you know, a surprise that it is a scientific finding. And it's not, you know, uh, a, one of these uh, things that, you know, uh, are hippy-dippy or something like that at all. They have to do with the most basic of human connections. Yeah, so it, it used to be a lot of this this talk was uh, kind of based on philosophy, and, and, and now it's like it's taking it out of that realm, and also maybe mysticism, right? And, and now right. it's kind of putting it, it's grounding it in, this is actual uh, physical science of what's kind of happening in, in our mind and, and uh, body um, and you did you didn't kind of talk about your metaphor that you personally have for what empathy is life like uh, do you have like a personal metaphor well it's not just one it, I, I think putting yourself in someone else's shoes seeing the world through someone else's eyes I mean those are very very appropriate ones uh, and they work very well taking someone else's viewpoint is another one 
uh, like that. That viewpoint metaphor has to do with another metaphor, which is knowing is seeing, where you understand something by seeing something thoroughly. And if you take someone else's viewpoint, you're seeing something clearly from someone else's view, thereby understanding things the way they would according to that metaphor. So that involves putting two basic metaphors together, both uh, the metaphor for the self and the metaphor for knowing and seeing. Um, okay. 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 I'm sorry to, to give you all the analysis of this, but... Yeah, that, that's okay. That's, that's what science is about. And uh, it's, we, uh, it, we study this stuff. Yeah, yeah. it's really fun uh, interviewing artists because they kind of like pop those metaphors up. Just, you know, they, they, they just love metaphors. And I love them too. They're a lot of fun. Well, I, they're wonderful. I mean, the metaphors uh, are what shape your brain and shape your understanding of the world. And uh, interesting artists are people who have understandings of the world that go beyond everybody else's un normal understandings of the world, which means they're extending metaphors. And that's great. That's a wonderful uh, 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 aspect of human experience. Okay, so we're, we're, I'm really spending a lot of time on this uh, empathy part, you know, in the definition. So thanks for kind of bearing with me, because I think it's so foundational uh, to what everything else that you're kind of building um, up about the understanding of how progressive and and uh, and conservative morality works, and kind of understanding the dynamics, and and so maybe we could start going into uh, that more, uh, kind of step by step. So we're at the point where we want to foster this sense of connection uh, between this empathic connection, and there's there's things that are blocking it. And it, you're saying that uh, conservatives in some way are, are kind of like blocking the empathic connection. They're, they're, they have a different uh, sense of morality. Well, they have a very different uh, uh, theory of morality. So if you look at conservative family models, uh, you have a strict father family where uh, first the father is the ultimate authority. He knows right from wrong and what he says goes. And he, you know, knows more than anybody else. And, and his authority cannot be challenged, first. Secondly, uh, uh, if in a family where uh, there is a wife uh, and, it's, and a strict father, the role of the wife is to uh, uphold uh, the authority of the father and to follow that. Uh, that, of course, isn't always true. In the family, but this is the as the the ideal case of the strict father family. Now, of course, there can be no a no father around, and a mother can take the father's role and be a strict mother in a, a single a single parent family, or not. They can be either way. Uh, also, as I said, some people are partly nurturant and partly strict. Now, in a strict father family, which is just about that, um, the role of the father is to teach children right from wrong. And the assumption is children want to do what feels good and that that's bad. They don't know right from wrong. And the role of the father is to punish them when they do wrong, right? So that they will, and it has to be painful enough so they'll want to avoid the punishment and learn the discipline of not doing wrong. So part of this is the father has to, to punish the child painfully enough so that they will get the discipline to, be, to have moral discipline. Could, could we step back a little bit in the sense that with it with empathy, it's like you it, for me, uh, empathy, I'm looking at a culture of empathy, which is everybody listens to everybody else to the maximum amount, empathizes with everyone else. So there's maximum empathy for, for you, to me, me, to you, to our families, to the whole of society and that no one's left out. And then uh, if you're talking about kind of the strict father, you're saying who who gets heard in this situation, right? Who is the one who is going to be heard in, in, in among us? Is Not that right? Heard, but who is going to be obeyed? You know, and who's going to do the punishing and who's going to use force? In a strict father family, it is a moral obligation of the strict father to punish the children so that they will become moral beings and get discipline. And if they have discipline, then they can go out in the world and prosper. And if, therefore, if someone isn't prospering, they don't have discipline, they can't be moral, so they deserve their poverty. 
which is part of uh, uh, conservative thought. So this is a major part of the strict father family. It's also the case that what you're supposed to do is uh, foster discipline in a child. And if the child rebels still, then the child is, uh, you know, has bad character. There's something wrong with the child, right? And that uh, they therefore, uh, you know, aren't deserving. Uh, their will should be broken is the way that this is done in conservative child-rearing uh, uh, child manuals. You're supposed to break the will of the child to, to obey the legitimate authority. And uh, that is, goes along in politics with uh, uh, a punitive view of prisons, of sentencing, and so on. Uh, you know, that is, rather than uh, trying to make someone into a better person, you, pu you punish them which assumes that that is what makes them into a better person. Yeah, so it's like the basic, the, the family model, uh, the interpersonal model is getting reflected at a, at a, at a societal and, uh, and uh, political level. Then personal interaction is being manifest then at that level. Uh, you know, you're saying about the strict uh, father and it's like, here's the rules, here's the discipline. And isn't part of that like about uh, it's a dangerous world? We have to close ourselves off. We have to follow through because there's so much danger out in the world. And this is the best way of, of addressing that uh, danger. That's exactly right. If you go back to uh, the Reagan era and the, um, uh, the uh, hearings about Iran-Contra, uh, the very first uh, thing that was said, uh, you know, uh, in those hearings by the conservative witnesses is, this is a dangerous world, repeated over and over. This is a dangerous world. And that whole set, as soon as you say that, what you're doing is bringing up fear and blocking empathy. It's the, the very first thing that happens. And uh, that's, that's a very important thing. Now, one thing that's important in the nurturing parent family is the nurturing parent also wants to get the children to be disciplined, to do things so that they're not harmed and don't harm other people. But you do that through empathy. That is, empathy can provide a form of internal discipline when you have a responsibility to help other people and to empathize with them so that you can build a positive discipline rather than a negative discipline. And there are whole books now on child rearing called Positive Discipline. Uh, very important to have positive discipline via empathy. So a lot of conservatives will think the only way you can be disciplined is by being punished. And being, you know, that's just simply not true. The best way is to be disciplined by uh, thinking about other people and acting responsibly for them as well as for yourself. Yeah. So if in in this in discipline, so if someone has done harm to someone, it's it's like you can punish them and give them pain and and suffering so that they you know hopefully don't do it again. Or you can somehow find a way to empathically restore empathic connection. And there's a whole process out there of restorative justice, or what I would call restorative empathy, which are processes for getting you know people who have done harm to each other to create a circle process and, and uh, have dialogue and uh, reconnect with each other. Yeah, I think that's right. I think it's very important. Yeah, so the, the, it seems to me that for what you're talking about is that the, the a, really a core part is this relationship between fear and empathy and, and how it relates. Do we nurture fear and, and how we deal with fear and how do we uh, nurture kind of this uh, connection between people and this mm -hmm. empathic connection and with the fear being something that you know makes us close off and um, you know empathy which is something that kind of opens and connects us well but fear is real and and important that we evolved to have fear in the right ways there are things that we should fear you know that's you know there are uh, times when you shouldn't have empathy you know, if somebody's trying to kill you, you know, you should stop. You know, you should fear them uh, and stop them. Uh, you know, if someone, you know, th that's real. And, uh, you know, uh, and that, uh, and, uh, you know, attacks are going to happen. 
other people will, uh, you, you know, grow up without empathy. That's inevitably going to happen when you have parenting that is neglectful or harmful. Uh, that will happen. So, or abusive. So, you know, that's real in the world. And you should have, have fear in the right ways. You should have fear about global warming. That's a very, very real thing. Now, fear shuts, may shut off the empathy toward uh, uh, the world, and that's what you don't want to do. What you want to do uh, is address the real fear by saying, hey, look at how we connect with the world. And, 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 that's what, and we have to act positively on that. Uh, just promoting the fear is not going to promote the empathy needed to address global warming. Yeah. So uh, you've written this uh, the, this book, uh, the, the the little blue book, and it's it's kind of based on on all the, what we're talking about here on the em on empathy and how how Democrats and progressives can do more to uh, kind of frame their language uh, so that it fosters empathy and fosters connection. That's right. Well, what the idea is this. Um, the conservatives have framed just about every issue because they have a greatly superior um, uh, understanding of the role of morality in, in politics, uh, whereas the Democrats have largely been thinking about the role of policy in politics. And um, all policies are based on morality. All, all politics is moral. You know, politicians say, do what I say because it's right, not because it's wrong or doesn't matter. So it's all based on morality, and the question is, is it conservative morality or progressive morality? And the conservatives have gotten uh, their framing and their language out there. All words are defined relative to frames, and the frames in politics are all defined relative to moral systems. So every policy that a conservative or a progressive has is understood relative to their understanding of what is moral. Now, uh, if you adopt other people's language, you adopt their frames and, uh, and strengthen their moral system in you. That is, it is it, 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 you're changing your brain and the brains of other people. So what you want to do is strengthen the, um, the moral systems based on empathy. And that means not using other people's language, not just taking their language and negating it as if you could logically argue against it. This isn't about logic, it's about understanding. And uh, what usually happens is that conservative framing hides a deep truth in various areas. So uh, in, in economics, the first deep truth is the private depends on the public. You shouldn't be just privatizing. Uh, the second one is that um, the public is there to carry out uh, moral responsibilities. So you might privatize practical things like building of roads. You might hire local contractors, and you should. That's practical privatization. But there's moral privatization that should never happen. You shouldn't turn over moral uh, issues to private companies for their wealth. Uh, for example, you shouldn't have private prisons uh, where, you, uh, where, where the prisoners' lives and health uh, are there uh, because of companies trying to make money. Uh, and therefore what they'll do is cut down on prison guards and, you know, and, and conditions and uh, people will die and, and uh, you know, be harmed by that. Uh, but it's not just prisons, it's schools. Uh, you don't just shut down public education and privatize it. So our, education our, is moral. So what we're really looking at is how do we create a language of empathy, basically? How does every policy uh, kind of relate to fostering, nurturing, promoting empathy? And how do we have a language that uh, can kind of articulate that? But the language is secondary to the ideas. The question is, how do we understand what ideas about various areas like education, or the environment flow from empathy rather than from uh, you know self-interest and just trying to maximize your pro short-term profits, right? How do you do that? How does it flow from uh, caring about other people rather than um, having a strict father morality? Uh, that has to do with how women are treated in society. It has everything to do with male empathy for women. Uh, and that's crucial. 
Um, you know, there are uh, every every issue has to do with empathy and with understanding the ideas, the political and social ideas that flow from empathy. And then you can get a language of empathy. And when you do that, you undermine the conservative ideas. So you, you're talking about uh, self-interest. So in, in a way, self-interest is how is about how do I shut off my empathy for others and just focus on what's going on inside myself. Um, I know that we this is we're gone on for about an hour, so I don't want to kind of keep you. I don't know if you have sure. other appointments and all that sure. kind of yeah. stuff. I mean, I could go on. I want to say that uh, in my kind of exploration of you know of, of of existence, life, my quest, you know, for what are values and progressive values, I was highly influenced by your work. So it's just such a pleasure to talk to you you know, about empathy, the nature of empathy. So um, I feel like it could go on for hours, uh, you know, kind of exploring this sure. in, in, and perhaps we can have other dialogues, but um, uh, we've gone on for an hour, so I don't want to kind of go over kind okay. of the, the time. It's a real pleasure to talk with you always. Uh, and I have to say, I deeply admire you for taking up this most central part of uh, our connection to other beings, uh, our connection to the world, uh, and the way our politics is run, and by devoting yourself to uh, a culture of empathy. I think it's one of the best things one could do in life, and thank you for that. Well, thank you for taking the time and uh, to share your thoughts on, on this, and I look forward to uh, future discussions and working together to build a culture of empathy Absolutely. Uh, worldwide. Yeah. So, Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, George. Bye. See the world through other people's eyes. Now, empathy is a quality of character that can change the world.